the people? Yes, I did. Okay, let's just see if they have it ready for you or you can share. I can I can share on my side, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Should I share my 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 screen? Yeah. I think um, it should it should be appearing. Is there a problem with sharing it from um, the technical group? I. I, I, okay. Okay, yeah, I, I can see it now. Is that okay. better? Yes. yes. Right. Will I be able to move it? You just say, just ask them and they'll do it for you. Next slide. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Che. Um, it is my my pleasure to greet um, all the Siapumelela conference participants who have joined me today, and I think I want to greet especially Miss Leslie Smith, who I think is here to support me today, and other Nelson Mandela University staff members. My name is Lumelo Sonjani, a postgrad student in the Nelson Mandela University doing the A honors in public administration. Um, can I have the next? Oh, my, my topic today will be advancing quantile, quantile one to three student support interventions. Can I please have the next screen? Thank you. Um, the project's main objective is to give an appropriate and meaningful support to quintile one to three students as they transition to the university environment. The quintile one to three students often face more significant difficulty transitioning into higher institutions of learning because they stem from poor economic schooling. This results in them facing a huge cultural shock and experiencing poor academic performance due to slow adaptation to the higher education environment. This, the, project, the project addresses strat strategies to be used in order for the student support interventions to appeal and be more relevant to quintile one to three students, as well as prevent any opportunities of poor academic performance. Now, I, I will go to the issues of but there has been major. So there has been made made. Oh, I'm sorry. There's something which hides. Yes, there has been major changes in the enrollment into higher education. This is as a result of the Higher Education Act that mandates all admission policies to redress past inequalities. So this made admission quotas of institutions to focus more on the marginalized groups. Despite major changes in, 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 in enrollment demographics, student success remain racially skewed such that only 7% of African and colored youths are succeeding in the higher education. Most of the reasons for the low student success, especially from the quintile one to three students, are attributed to apartheid inefficiencies, socio-political and economic discourses. It is often blamed on lack of infrastructural capacity to prepare students for the higher education studies. According, oh yeah, can, can I please have the next slide?
A study by the Council of Higher Education in 2010 concluded that the student-related factors which causes low uh, success rates includes Can I please have the next slide, please? Yes. So a study by the Council of Higher Education in 2010, I, you keep on going back to the, to the previous slide. Sorry about that, just a second. Okay. Hi, Sumena, is this where you are? Sorry? Is this where you are? No, no, no. Is this no. the correct slide? Is it the slide before? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the slide before. Um, um, just no, a no. second. This Let's one, back. right? Back again? Yes, 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 Issues? yes, I'm here. Yes, All I'm right, here. sure, sorry about yes. that. Okay, as, as I was saying, a study by the Council of uh, Higher Education in 2010 concluded that the student-related factor, factors which causes low graduation rates includes underpreparedness or students not being academically strong enough, students' approach to learning and their attitude and expectations, issues of the student life and other pressure, pressures such as personal, social, financial, or family-related matters, a diminished learning culture or students taking less responsibility for their learning and issues of students' prior learning and language skills. Some systematic factors include too little support for students making the transition from school, a lack of coordination and systematic assessment of, of the support initiative that have been attempted. A study conducted by Ramrathan and Pillay in 2015, which studied the dropout rates in terms of biological differences, found that African students who come from a background of poor infrastructural schooling to have the highest dropout rate compared to other race groups. The attributes to student dropout within South African universities have largely been based on socio-political and biographical factors. It is therefore suggested that a race-based focus on student dropout should be reimagined. Now I will go to my background based on my higher education journey. When I started university, I was doing BSc in construction studies. I battled with this course till I decided to drop it in 2017. I then decided to enroll on BA politics and public administration in 2018 and completed it in 2020. My undergrad academic life can be summarized as a two stream journey. The first stream is when I grappled with BSc in construction studies from first year till from 2015 first year till 2017. The first stream is categorized with failure, hardships, anxiety and depression. The second stream is from 2018 when I started BA to 2020 when I completed my PA degree. The second stream is categorized with success, record time and positivity. Now this, big, this brief background will become relevant as I draw this presentation. Let me start by providing an account of what I deem as having to have contributed on my failures in my first stream uh, journey and successes in my second stream journey. The next slide, please. I did my basic education in Township Quintile 1 to, th to three schools where I was taught English in my home language. And yes, I was taught English in, in Corsa. No access to computer literacy programs and many other relevant resources. Now, as a first year in 2015, I came to a fully English-based learning environment where lecturers were rushing to finish the content without giving attention to myself who is facing language barrier issues. 
Additionally, it was my first time interacting with a computer to a point where it took me days to type an assignment after first pen writing it down. Entering the student portal and mails gave me anxiety attacks. This felt as highly complex systems with many things I've never understood on the screen. I ended up failing my computer literacy program. Meanwhile, I was facing cultural shock of being in a totally different world, coming from a township to a totally flamboyant, dynamic and advanced world, world was too overwhelming. The next page, please. After the end of the semester, I failed several modules. I felt very useless and dejected, but because no one was on my side, I kept to myself. At the time, I never knew all the avenues that are available from the institution in order to recoup from my poor academic performance. No one was there to tell me that failing modules is common amongst the students and that there are various ways to overcome it. It. I could not even speak to my peers as I feared humiliation. On December 2015, I received an academic warning and I became more demoralized and slowly lost interest in education. I tried uh, attending student counseling as advised by the letter of exclusion, but the sessions were too generic, broad and not close to addressing my anxiety. Uh, my second stream where I studied BA comes when I was fully capacitated and aware of the avenues of support available at the Nelson Mandela University, such as academic support, tutoring, writing centers, library services, information services, request for multilingual tutoring, and, all, and et cetera. I was fully computer literate and familiar with the university environment and language of communication. I knew that lecturers are not aliens. They can be engaged at any time if you fail to grasp the content or have any problems that you might face academically. And because of that, I passed all my modules and graduated my PA degree in record time. And I do not think that my background in computer liter literacy, I do not think that my cultural shock, my language barrier issues, and all those issues I faced caused my academic collapse, collapse in the first stream. But I think what caused my poor academic performance and academic collapse was the absence of a concentrated guidance, a personal support that is specific to my issues, which understands my background and is a wealth of knowledge and have experience in the same road I, I am traveling. Can I get the next slide? Now, this is a table which shows um, over a period of three years, all the quantiles with their success rates. Now, if you notice, you notice that the quantile one to three success rates are consistently lower than the success rates for other students or other quantiles and the combined total. It is then my opinion that the success rates combined with my personal reflection shared earlier alludes to a disconnect between the support interventions offered by the university and the quantile one to three students. The impact of COVID-19 or digital learning on first year students who come from quintile one to three will be vast. Most of those learners have never interacted with computers before, but are now expected to fully study digitally while also doing computer modules in a digital platform. The institution does have support, student support interventions, but according to my experience, I experienced them as either, as either too generic, too specific and limited. Now you might think that there's a, 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 a a contradiction from too generic and too specific. But let, let me first start here.
firstly, students are given the, the opportunity to conduct lecturers, tutors, or SI leaders. But that approach is limited only to engagements about a specific module and does not give space for a student to receive guidance in other aspects of the university or academic life outside of the module concerned. Now, now, now that is the support interventions being too specific. Secondly, at the start of the year, Nelson Mandela University has a, has a program, which is the How to at, at Mandela First Year Success Program. This is a general program and is presented over a, a short period, a short space of time. And they deal with a, with a lot of students at, at, the, at, the, at the same time. So that is the, those support interventions now being too generic. Lastly, some residences do offer mentorship programs. They do offer individual attention as they, they do not offer individual attention as they handle large groups at once and have a blanket, a blanket approach. Now that is those support interventions now also being too generic. Um, the, the, the screen has, uh, it has disappeared now. The, the, the presentation has disappeared. Um, Chair. I do not know what has happened to the technical team. Uh, could you just share your slide? Let me try that, please. Is my screen visible? No, it's, it says it started sharing, but we don't see anything. Okay. There seems to be some technical problem. Um, could you just talk to your slides and not worry about the screen? Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'll do that now. I'm trying to open the slides. Apologies, everyone. I think I may have um, a bit of a technical glitch on my side. Um, Shamela, are you winning or must I continue sharing your screen for you? Um, I'm, I'm trying on my side to open the slide so that just in case. Okay, all right. So share the, 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 the PowerPoint that is up on the screen at the moment. And um, I 
I would just continue talking. We uh, continue talking to us. We we can listen to you, and then the slides come back. It will be fine. Okay. Okay. Now, now, as I was saying, um, so I was speaking of the support interventions being too generic, too specific, and limited. So I mentioned an example of um, the. The, the students being given in, 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 in terms of the support interventions, they are given a, a, a time to engage the SI leaders, the tutors and the lecturers, but those now interventions uh, are, are too specific to a certain module. I then went to the second, um, to the second um, support intervention, which is how to at, at Mandela first year success program and that one, that, that support intervention being too generic. Now, lastly, I was at some residences do offer uh, mentorship programs. Now they do offer, they do not offer individual attention as they handle large groups at the same time. So those are the support now interventions being too generic. Now the students who do not reside in big residences, in, in big residence properties, do not do not have this opportunity because it's only available within big residencies. Now, on the next slide, I have the proposed plan. Now, in responding to the problems noted above, I propose then the strategy of the strategy of one-on-one -on -one personal mentor programs. To quintile, to quintile one, one to three students doing first year for the first time. Now, final year and post-grad quintile one to three students who have worked in the path of being a first year student, a first year quintile one to three students will be ideal for this program. There are, these students are well equipped with the university procedures, processes, structures, life experiences, academic support interventions, computer literacy, and so on. Their role would be to monitor, offer personalized support, be a source of knowledge and guide the student while they are finding their feet in the tertiary environment. This program will give an opportunity for the personal mentors to monitor and report to the project administration where they see their first years showing signs of difficulties in the university. And the project administration will contact the relevant departments and officers to aid the student in order to prevent failure. The personal mentor project will attract final year and post-grad students through giving them recognition for their participation and service through the co-curricular record which would enhance their profile and CV as they are transitioning to the workspace. The co-curricular record positions are limited and this will be a great opportunity for the students. This means that the project will not incur costs as a result of remuner remunerations to personal mentors in the form of money, but they will receive co-curricular and CV enhancement opportunities. The role of the project administration is to make sure that each personal mentor is allocated to the closest match of first year student. In essence, the personal mentors and first years of the same background, ethnicity, in necessary cases, language, faculty, same financial background, and etc., will need to be matched as much as possible. The personal mentor project will be implemented in the form of a pilot project to start on a small scale and, and, and expand as the project renders successful results. Nelson Mandela University has an identification system that flags students according to their risks of facing poor academic performance. The pilot project will identify and work with quintile one to three first year students flagged as having high risks of getting lower academic results and other possible risk indicators. The students participate, partner, the student, uh, sorry, the project is partnering with the learning development cluster of the learning and teaching collaborative for success, 
the LT Collab, that will be trusted to implement and avail resources to make this program a, su a success. The project is still in the planning stages and all relevant stakeholders are being consulted. Now, this is a broad overview of the model of implementation where the first step will be to conduct the flex students and identify personal mentors. The second one will be to train the personal mentors. And the third step will be to match the mentees and the personal mentors with a particular criteria. And then to make sure that they establish the, a, a contact system which is comfortable to them, then evaluation and quality assurance. Now, at the end of the terms, we will require that the personal mentors uh, give us reports on the program. And also we ask for feedback surveys from the mentees. Now, the role of the project, project administrator administration will be to guide, intervene, and allow us with relevant support programs and stakeholders. Now, to conclude, there are currently no results as the project is still in its initial phase. The, desire, the, the desired outcome of this project is that all the flex students, quintile one to three, must neither drop out nor be lost within the system. They must be properly guided and aided with information they need in order to graduate in minimal time. It will be an honor to share the results of this project with, the prof with this professional network in the future. Now, importantly, I would like to thank Professor Cheryl Foxcroft, our, our DVC of Learning and Teaching, and the Learning Development Cluster of the Nelson Mandela University for considering my proposal and for hearing the student voice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a uh, illustrative uh, life story that has resulted in a project at a university. Um, I think it's uh, uh, quite uh, a, an achievement for you, so congratulations. Um, and uh, we apologize for the technical things, but you have shown your grit in being able to continue uh, when things go wrong. Are there any questions from the audience? Marilla. Uh, thank you very much. And firstly, thank you, um, Clumelo, for a, a very inspiring um, presentation. Um, what I was very interested to understand, you spoke about your first experience, which was so difficult at the university. And then you spoke about the second stream, your second experience in, in which everything um, came together and you were very successful. But I'd be very keen to hear a little bit more information about what changed in the second stream. You suddenly, you said you suddenly had, you understood the I, ICT, the uh, issues of language, everything came together. But how did it come together? What was the intervention? What actually happened to support you to succeed in your second round of studies? Okay, okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I, think, I think what changed um, is the fact that uh, 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 all along the first stream when I was, I was struggling academically, I, 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 I got used, I, I was learning to get used to the, to the environment. Now I, I, I got to, I got to get comfortable with the university environment. Remember in the first stream, I was facing a, a, a cultural shock from, from a township to a totally different and flamboyant uh, 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 environment. Now I, I, I got used to the, even the language which is used for an instance, in, in, in my in my high school, I someone who speaks English, it was it was it was not usual. 
it was not a, a norm, you see. So, so within the three years I was struggling with this course, I was also learning how to uh, be comfortable within the, the, the environment, within the higher education environment, or rather the Nelson Mandela University. I also got used to the support interventions which are, are, are being offered by the university. I could understand that. In, for instance, I, I, I knew there was a library, but I could not use the library. So in the in, in the three years, I got to learn how to use the library effectively, and 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 the fact that there is, uh, for instance, a request for multilingual uh, uh, tutoring, I could just go to the to the lecturer and say, I don't understand this when you are lecturing me in, in your in in English. Now, can I get a, a closer tutor, SI leader, in order for me to understand? And now, uh, in my in my first year, my second year, I was scared to consult the lecturer. But now I, I, I've gotten more comfortable to go to the lecturer and be able to engage the lecturer on a, on, in, in, in their office. So, so, so I, I've gotten used of the support interventions which are offered by the university as time went by. Hence, hence I then su suggest the strategy of personal mentors who will be able to uh, make sure that they fasten that process of making sure that they, they, they speak to the individual student and, and, and be able to give them um, the, 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 the preparedness or rather the, the, the just to be bold enough to understand those support interventions first and also be bold enough to approach the particular departments or particular people involved. For instance, uh, if a first year might, might, be, might be scared to go and engage the lecturer, but once they hear from their senior that, no, it's something which happens, I know this lecturer, um, 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 you can just go and engage. Lecturers are not your aliens. You can go and engage. Now they would have that that momentum to be able to uh, to, to 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 be free to engage, and 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 also even in terms of the in terms of the library to go and also other support interventions and understand. Sometimes it's even lack of understanding that there's a particular support interventions within the university. So 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 that's what changed basically. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very helpful. I think we need to move on to the, the next uh, presentation. And uh, uh, the, the, what comes so clearly towards every, all of this is that when young people come to higher education, they do learn and they do succeed and having uh, new ways of helping people is always very beneficial. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So our next presentation is from Faroza Hafji from the University, the Durban University of Technology, and she's going to talk about photo voice. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'll share my screen from my side. I think it'll be a little bit easier. So let me just get that going. Okay, is my screen visible? everything's great. Okay, wonderful. Um, all right, so as I was introduced, my name is Firoza Hafiji and I'm from the Durban University of Technology. My topic for today is Photo Voice, a new lens for the promotion of critical thinking whilst decolonizing the curriculum. So just a little bit of background. The predominant teaching mode in any typical South African university is the didactic mode of lecturing with an emphasis on information delivery. So we as lecturers tend to stand in the front and um, give off information in the lectures. Um, this is then reinforced by giving the students printed notes as well as electronic versions of the lectures, uh, perhaps on Moodle or Blackboard or whatever, uh, um, mode we are using at different universities. But in general, students tend to be passive recipients of information within the teaching and learning space. 
some of the challenges that we currently face are to produce graduates who are critical thinkers, that they are able to meet the varying needs of the workplace. At the same time, higher education institutions are also required to decolonize the curriculum so that students are responsive to local needs. And this decolonization stories have um, started a few years ago. So decolonization involves teaching students about their own environment within the context of their culture and country. This needs to occur within the context of curriculum transformation. It must allow for integration of disciplinary knowledge with socially distributed knowledge, hence integrating learning with its application in the broader community. Learning must be relevant and responsive to community health needs in order to improve the social responsibility of graduates. And I've got health needs here because uh, particularly my work is in the health sciences. So of course, in other disciplines, it would refer to needs within those disciplines. The aim of this study was to use photo voice as a participatory teaching method in order to engage health science students in a project to enhance their learning, as well as to decolonize the curriculum. So a little bit of background on this um, intervention. The photo voice assignment was presented to students registered for epidemiology public health in both 2019 as well as 2020. So there were two cohorts of students and the total number of uh, students in both the cohorts came to uh, 96. The students were required to work in self-selected groups of two to four students per group students needed to think about the local factors that were involved in causing disease. Thereafter, the students were required to take photographs of factors uh, within the environment that were involved in causing disease. There were no restrictions on the number of photographs that could be taken, and the photographs could either be taken individually by each member of uh, the group and then come together to discuss uh, the individual photos, or they could have taken them collectively as the group. And they were allowed to use either their cell phones, tablets, or digital cameras if they had them. So whatever means was available to the students uh, was permissible. The students were required to make field notes on each photograph. Group discussions were then held to discuss how the factors within their own environment affected the health of the people and the group they needed to select the best picture and the best presentation around that picture for presentation in class. Presentations were then held in class with a lecturer and um, another academic who was not involved in teaching in the class together with the entire class there. And that was in 2019. In 2020, because of the COVID restrictions, uh, these presentations were held on MS Teams. The presentations were based, uh, the, sorry, the assessments were based on the picture, presentation quality, as well as the ability to answer questions. For the research itself, focus group discussions were held to collect qualitative data around this new pedagogic tool in order to understand the important educational outcomes that could be reached. And these are the ones that we were interested in particularly for this presentation are critical thinking and decolonizing of the curriculum. The interviews were then transcribed and the data was analyzed using thematic analysis using checks eight steps. Of course, ethical clearance was obtained from the Durban University of Technology Research Committee prior to implementing the project and written informed consent was provided by all participants prior to engaging in the project. The following four themes emanated from this work, the experience with photo voice, perceptions of the lived realities within local communities, inculcation of critical thinking and decolonizing of the curriculum. So moving on to the first theme, which is the experience with photo voice. 
There was an affirmative response to the use of cell phone cameras to obtain photographs, which served as data for the project. And some of the quotes that came from the students, I think phones are equivalent to cameras. And another student said, we were comfortable using our cell phones. We use them for selfies anyway. Moving on to the second theme, the perceptions of lived realities within local communities. Students documented the lived realities that cause disease within their local communities. The role of governmental structures was also recognized, particularly where lack of facilities led to deteriorating environmental conditions. And as one of the groups said, uh, one of the participants said, it is a sad situation and the municipality is also not trying, you know. This picture is a picture from one of the groups from the 2020 cohort. And it shows a picture from the informal settlement in Mabel, Durban. The students were particularly concerned about uh, the crowding within these informal settlements. And they also brought um, uh, into their presentation the, uh, the littering and subsequent problems related to this. So, uh, in their presentation, the group said that crowding within the houses increases the risk of exposure to transmission of infectious diseases and also increases the risk of mental health illness. Um, and further on, they mentioned that overcrowding is favorable for the transmission of TB. So this was very interesting because they, uh, they looked at diseases that they had studied in previous parts of the module and they were able to link this to the environmental factors that they saw within their communities. And of course, within question time, they were also able uh, to then link this to the COVID-19 situation and the spread of this um, easy spread of uh, possibly COVID-19 within communities like this where people are unable to socially isolate. Linked to that, the students also uh, mentioned that uh, there was lack of um, piped water and sanitation. Um, this, uh, to overcome the problem, there were portable toilets that were provided by the municipality, but that these were often not emptied out and this led to um, other problems as well. So some of the things that the students said, the inadequate sanitation and lack of running or tap purified water creates an environment with risks of infectious diseases diarrheal disease, worm infections, and other infectious diseases that spread via contaminated water are common. Families have difficulty with basic hygiene in their homes. Um, and uh, during the interviews, one of the students mentioned, the lack of infrastructure causes the citizens to use the bushes as their toilets. Not only does this create an unhygienic environment, but it also increases the vulnerability to crime and gender-based violence particularly at night. So we see that there, there are direct manifestations of not having the piped water and sanitation. And then there are other indirect problems uh, with the crime and the gender-based violence making things much worse than it actually appears uh, by just looking at it. All right, and uh, these pictures are still from that same group. Uh, where they spoke about the lack of uh, basic services such as uh, waste removal and provision of proper sanitation leading to dumping as well as subsequent downstream pollution. Um, uh, so here in this particular picture, we see a pile of rubbish sitting on the, on the verge uh, there on the pavement. And the students said that the pile of rubbish is a place for breeding parasites, which are vectors of disease. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a sewage pipe pillar behind uh, some of those informal homes. And uh, students noticed that there was a leakage from that sewage pipe and that was leaking into the stream down there at the back. So the sewage pipe is damaged and leaking into the river. This will cause bacterial infections such as salmonellosis, parasitic diseases such as hookworm infections and giardiasis uh, will be common, as will other causes of diarrhea. These diseases will be spread directly, especially to children who walk in the river. It will also spread to others living in downstream areas. So uh, this, uh, with some of these, uh, the students noted uh, that it is the diarrheal diseases are not necessarily only spreading by a hand mouth route or an anus mouth route, 
um, where um, organisms that cause diarrhea are ingested and then cause the diarrhea. But they looked at things like hookworm where uh, the disease actually spreads by larvae entering through the skin. And so they, they brought that in nicely by speaking about the children playing in the area and that leading to the uh, hookworm entering into the area of, uh, with the lobby entering in. Of course, with the further questioning, they were able to elaborate on that further. Uh, so from the previous slides, we do see some inculcation of critical thinking coming along um, and the students are uh, established that the product project promoted critical thinking. Um, the assignment demonstrated that learning can occur beyond the lecture room in local communities. And the students attested to this. When you look at these quotes here, we knew that we had to have problems and solutions at the end. They're speaking about the project. Um, it made thinking uh, deeper and that was an advantage. Another student said, it required me to think critically rather than just answering questions. I think it's a great way to learn. Moving on to the last theme now, which is decolonizing of the curriculum. The assignment helped to translate theory into practice and working in the context of local communities played a role in decolonizing the curriculum. Some of the quotes that I got from the students, we felt that the literature of health risks in informal settlements is limited. And we therefore decided to review that this area in order to describe and analyze the health threats and everyday risks that people in informal settlements face. Another student said, you see, these are things that were happening on the environment, honestly speaking, were always happening, but we were not aware of them because we never thought about them. We never took these into consideration until you gave us this assignment. And that was when the bell rang in my head. So this alone shows that it is important to actually um, uh, put them uh, putting them out there opened their eyes to what was actually going on within their communities otherwise it's just textbook learning and learning whatever they're getting out of the textbook and nothing additional coming through from there another student reiterated i think this was a good assignment because it was the one issue that we have especially in our areas yeah it's an issue that most people are facing Students reiterated that they were able to link theory uh, learned in previous sections of the module to the observations in the community. Uh, one of the students said, I feel as if we got to see how some diseases stand out from the ground above, meaning how the environment plays a huge part in terms of how it affects people's health. We got to see how things like pipe leakage, waste matter, etc., play a huge role in developing diseases in that area. And another student said, we might think that it might be a foreign agent, but maybe it's something that is in our gardens, in our water, in our normal environment. So I found it very informative that anything that we touch could be infective. And again, during discussion time, they were very nicely able to link this to the COVID-19 situation again, uh, with uh, the virus being left on uh, surfaces, et cetera, and the importance of um, hand sanitation, et cetera, that was brought in at that point. So the photo voice enables students to see the reality of disease causation within their local communities. It made what they learned feel real. Um, and the students said, well, apparently everything felt real because we spoke to some of the people we noticed a lot of the people were suffering from cholera, diarrhea, and skin problems due to the activities they do around the river and the water which they use, which is contaminated. And from this quote, uh, it was noticed that these students actually went a little bit beyond the assignment in that they engaged with the communities that they were working with. They spoke to the people in the area and some of the students went a little step further in that they tried to have uh, small educational sessions with people in the community that uh, they spoke to. And that was something very nice that came about in that with their learning, they took it further into the community so that they were able to engage 
um, or with the people. And, and this uh, shows that they will in future in their, uh, in their working environment be able to engage with people as well. And another student said, hmm, this assignment was really nice cause it wasn't that hectic. And we did something that we usually see, things that are happening in our communities. Of course, there was a negative voice uh, that came through from some of the students as well, but as, uh, some of them used the same negativity and converted that into positivity. So, so uh, while some of them found um, the use uh, the, where they couldn't get information from the internet as a negative source, others actually uh, looked at that in a much more positive way. So this first quote is a negative one where the student said, unlike research where we could just go uh, maybe on the internet and find out something, read books, it did require a lot. So this particular student felt that uh, this required much more from them uh, than they would have in a normal assignment where they could just source the information from the internet or books. However, another student said that the assignment was personalized we had to choose a place. It's not like something you can find on Google. We had to come up with our own ideas and share that with each other and then compare. So this particular student um, and the other members uh, within that group found that as a positive experience. Um, after the research was uh, over, I also compared the marks uh, to previous marks uh, obtained uh, within the module. And uh, as we can see on this graph, there was a large um, increase in the marks uh, that we obtained. At the bottom here, I've got uh, the test mark and the assignment marks. The test mark reflects uh, a test on a part of the module that was similar to the assignment. And the average mark that was obtained there was 61.6%, whereas in the assignment, the average mark was 73.8%. So there was a huge uh, increase in the marks. And if we look at the number of uh, distinctions that were obtained, they more than tripled. So there were, I think it was six or seven distinctions in the test, and that went up to 22 distinctions in the assignment. Um, a small increase in the trend um, in those that had these. Uh, fewer numbers of Cs um, in the assignment compared uh, to uh, the test, but that's because of the push that occurred to the right here. There were two students that failed the test. Um, however, there were no failures and no students that obtained marks uh, in the 50s as well. So there was a definite increase in that. Uh, currently, DOT has got a project where they're speaking about mo moving to the middle. Um, or moving the middle student where we are actually trying to uh, move students in the middle brackets to higher brackets uh, uh, marks. And I think something like this uh, feeds in very nicely to that because uh, we are actually improving marks as we are moving along with projects like this. So some of the concluding facts, the photo voice project broadened the lens through which uh, the curriculum was viewed. It promoted critical thinking about local aspects of public health. With this emphasis on South African knowledge, it prepared students to work within the local and national context. This alternate pedagogy can be used to decolonize the curriculum so that students are responsive to local societal needs. It also has the potential to produce graduates who are reactive to local requirements of the community. Um, and finally, it has established that innovation of the curriculum whilst providing a distinctive education to students who eng engaged with society. This photo voice project demonstrated the commitment to duties and vision 2030. And finally, I'd like to share this quote from a student. Um, in the uh, last part of the interviews, I always ask them if there's anything additional that they want to add. And uh, this particular student addressed this directly to me, where he said that cre uh, creative thinking would not have been possible. I think I can't see the top part of my screen for some reason. Uh, okay, this, so this creative thinking would not have been possible if it was, um, it was more of an effort coming from you. You know, grooming our minds and enlightening us with issues that we live with. So it was a high favor coming from you 
thanks a lot. And for me, this was a real feather in my cap. Um, that the work that I did was appreciated by the students and that they did feel that it benefited them as well. And I think this is something great to take forward with where critical thinking needs to come through from academics first before we can actually expect it to come through from our students. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, your, your story today uh, fills my heart with uh, joy because I have always advocated that authentic learning where students actually do real work with real puzzles and real things in the world is one of the most invigorating for them and a deep learning experience. So thank you for sharing this with us. I think it's a, a, a wonderful idea to think about using something as simple as their phones to uh, document and make them think about the world in which we live. So thank you. Are there any other questions people would like to ask? Maybe I can ask a question. How, how did you manage uh, group work, assignment and uh, grading thereof? Um. Okay, so the, the students, uh, um, first year I put them into self-selected groups and then I had a marking rubric uh, uh, that was given to the students. Unfortunately, I didn't share that with you. So the marking rubric um, involved partly the, the assignment itself where they went out into the community, took the pictures, who took the picture and whether everybody uh, actually got together and uh, discussed the picture, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, they then had to prepare the talk, which needed to be done uh, collectively as the group. And the presentation also, I encouraged everybody within the group to present so that they didn't necessarily choose the best speaker and ask the best speaker to present, but everybody needed to be given an opportunity to present part of uh, the work and it was then shared. So the, uh, the, the mark for that was shared. So it was um, left to the group to actually practice beforehand so that um, they could the, the better ones could encourage the weaker ones and that helped the students to work um, together as a group uh, and function better as well and 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 I found that this did help the students whether where the stronger students actually mentored the weaker students um, it also encouraged everybody to work and uh, the groups were told in no uncertain terms that they needed to report people that did not uh, communicate within the group and everybody was asked during question time quite openly whether there were people within the group that did not communicate and uh, fortunately uh, there didn't seem to be a problem and everybody did seem uh, it did seem as though everybody communicated and so the mark was actually a collective mark that was given to the group and not uh, separately to individuals within the group thank you okay are there any other questions, comments? There are some nice comments in the chat if you would like to have a look. Oh, okay, I need to put that on and have a look at that, thanks. <laughs> so if there are uh, no other uh, um, questions, I would just like to, um, uh, this is one of the ways in which some people are saying about how do we assess people uh, in environments where uh, we have to have closed books and all the rest? Um, my experience has been that when, when you actually help students to do really complex tasks, they learn far more and they understand much more deeply than if we just give them something to memorize. So I am a great, uh, believer in having students working together on different projects. One of the tricks that I've used in the past, just to tell you about, you said that you asked the students who didn't work. Uh, I also used that trick. So if I would ask the group who didn't work, and if they, if I found out that they, they fibbed to me and said, oh, you, we all did together, I would just make their mark half of what it was and tell the whole class that 
it only had to happen once. And they then started saying, well, this one didn't do that. And this one did more than that. And then we can scuffle the works. So there are ways in which we can play the devil's advocate in the classroom. So thank you very much for enlightening us on your experience. Thank so you, just session, a talking to you. Thank you. So this session is, is finished now. You can stay here and talk to each other if you wish uh, or not. And we will then reconvene for the plenary session, which will start at quarter past 11. And it's a new Zoom link. So thank you everyone for being with us and I look forward to seeing you in the plenary. Thanks, Alan. Thanks everyone. You're welcome.